mind. We discussed last week whether your faith is intentional or is it accidental. And I showed you an article that was written by a gentleman where the statement he made is that, you know, there, there's a large percentage of Americans who profess to have a faith in Christ, but in no way does that impact how they live. And we discussed that that means that, you know, there must be some kind of gap that exists between this profession and action, between this intent and how does that translate to action. And so I wanted to build on that this morning. I believe that there are certain things where we see this gap, where we see this, this middle piece between intent and action. There's something else that's there. The gap isn't void, is what I'm getting at. So we put up on the screen for you, it said intent, action, and then gap. But see, that's a little bit misleading because gap can encompass a lot of things, right? The gap is not void, it's not empty, nothing exists there. If something is getting in between our will and our want to live intentionally for Christ, and that translating into our actions and actually following and obey Him, well that means there's something there in between those two things, right? Something exists there. And so I want to explore what should be there, but how often, so many times, what is there? What is there? I am persuaded, if you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, let's all turn in our Bibles and go there. Turn in your Bible app if that's easier for you. But I'm encouraging you to follow along. This morning's lesson, I think I'm praying, and I've been praying about it, and I pray it challenges you. Because it has challenged me. Because if we look honestly and intently in our lives, we'll find out, hopefully not, but sometimes we find out there is this gap that exists. And there's something in the gap. And sometimes it's not the something that it should be. So what should be in the gap? Now this was not your scripture reading, although it's up on the screen. This Matthew 6.33 is not your scripture reading but it's the verse that we're going to focus on for most of this morning. We're actually going to focus on the entire passage, but in verse 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. The question that was asked when, when John's disciples decided to go and turn and follow Jesus, he turns around, and depending on your translation, it'll say, it says, what are you looking for, or what do you want? One translation says, what are you seeking? That's the question that Jesus asks. And I believe that question is relevant today because we're all seeking something, whether we recognize it or not. And Jesus answers that question here in Matthew chapter 6, when you get down to verse 25, and this is where it leads on into verse 33. What is filling the gap for us is whatever we're looking for, is whatever we're seeking after. So my question is this, is if we're trying to live intentionally, but yet that does not translate into action in my faith, then if I am seeking something, then the something that I'm seeking is not after God if that doesn't turn into action. Do you follow me so far? So I have to analyze, okay, what am I actually seeking after? What am I looking after? So if you're taking notes in your bulletin this morning, this is the flow that will follow. We're going to look at this gap. So that's your first point. We're going to look at this gap. Then we're going to look at the position that God should have in our lives. And then we're going to look at the standard that God has set for us, all from this passage. So if you put those together, that's your GPS, right? This is what is going to orient us and direct us and where we need to go. So last week we talked about King Josiah. He came to the throne when he was eight years old. We looked at, in 2 Kings, how he lived intentionally looking after God. If you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and you read that, it's a parallel passage, but what it tells you is Josiah was seeking after God. That, that is how he lived intentionally, is that he oriented his life to seek after God. And when he did that, his actions follow suit. 
So what do we have to do? What's, what's in our gap for us? What exists for us? Stay in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Let's start in verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin or thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? Verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough trouble for its own. We, we notice here in this passage, we see there are elements that fit into what we call the gap. He tackles, first of all, he says food and clothing. This, this is your daily substance, right? The, these are the necessities of life that we must have. If we are to survive, we need food, clothing, which also consists of our shelter, so right away, right out of the gate, Christ tackles this. He says, look, these are the things that you're worrying about. And I believe sometimes that exists for us in the church. Christ doesn't point these out for no specific reason. He knows these are the things that we chase after. I'm worrying about what I'm going to have. I'm worrying about what I'm going to wear. I was reading one, one commentary, and he put it this way. As he compares and he talks about the birds, how God feeds them, you ever meet a bird with an ulcer? No. Because they don't worry about things like that. You ever look at a flower and think, man, that flower must be sure stressed out about what it's going to wear tomorrow? No. No. And if we put that in context of our life, do we not understand that God's going to take care of you and your basic needs? But, but yet we, we seek after these things so much. The Bible tells us where your treasure is, your heart is also. Sometimes we get that backwards. Sometimes we say where, you know, where our heart is, our treasure is also. But it's not, it's not written that way. What do you treasure? Whatever you treasure and whatever you seek at, that's where, you're, that's where we're going to find your heart. You see, and we substitute those things that for very good and natural things. As the Bible points out here, you know, we have to feed ourselves, right? We've got to have some kind of basic clothing. But we start filling these gaps with all kinds of things, Right? I, I, fill it, I fill it with my family. I fill it with my job. I fill it with my hobbies. I fill it with my friends. I, I fill it with my career. I fill it with all of these things, which in and of themselves are okay, right? But when you're seeking after these things first, and not after your God, well, now there comes this disconnect that exists. But we seem to get this misconception that I'm being filled by it, right? As, as I go and, and I work hard and I get my promotion, whatever the case may be, I, I'm being filled in some way. Let's not lie to ourselves. It feels good. And educating yourself is great. But take that and apply it to anything else. And that's what I'm getting filled with, whether it's, it's my kids or my grandkids or whatever the case may be. And that is filling me up. But we get this misconception that that is filling you spiritually when it's not. And the best way I can put it is if you've got to know me by now over these last two years, it's like eating donuts. 
right? Some of you are like, that's too far, Raymond. But that's what it's like. You see, when you're hungry and your body is craving food, you can go down to Rebel Donuts and you can get all the nice look. I mean, they're, they're ornamented real nice. They've got great design to them. They look real pretty. And guess what? They taste real good. Okay? And you can have that for dinner, right? You can go and you can eat it and you'll actually be full when you leave. And you're thinking to yourself, I've done that. It provides you no nutritional value. And see, when we're seeking after these things that aren't God, they're great, and it may fill us up for a time, but guess what? It provides us no spiritual value. It's, even though we may feel full, it's not feeding us spiritually. So what am I seeking after? What am I looking after? And then we get down to verse 33 where he says, Seek ye first. Seek ye first. See, that's, that's the positional part in your notes now. That's God saying, at what place do you have me prioritized in your life? Right? Where, where am I? Where do I exist? Now, I know you may be looking after me as, as you raise your family, as you work in your career, as you, as you go and play your hobby, as you do this and you do that, but what place do I have in your life? What, what position do I take? I like how somebody else put it. They put, your relationship with someone is the position you hold in respect of that person. So my relationship with you is going to determine the position you have in my life. Does that make sense? So uh, my, I'm married to my wife. That's my, that's my other half, right? And so we have a relationship that exists that is much deeper than I have with anyone else. And so the position she holds in my life is much higher, right? What relationship do you have with God? And what position does he hold in your life? Because there's no other place that he can be, no other position he can have other than first, and what happens when you have a relationship with someone? There's all kinds of things involved in that, right? You, you grow together. You talk. You communicate. There's a familiarity. So again, what kind of relationship do you have with God? Is it, is it one where we only call on him when things get bad? Is he my life jacket? Is he only my life jacket? Is he only my life bow? Is the only time I ring out to God is when I'm dialing 911, or do I talk to him on a daily basis? Tell me, how well does your marriage go when you don't talk to your spouse daily? <laughs> you totally broke my train of thought. <laughs> but, but we understand that when we don't talk to each other, then the relationship begins to break down, right? When you are not communing and speaking with God, involved with God on a daily basis, well, yeah, you can still, you know, persuade yourself in your mind that I have a relationship with him, but what position does he take in your life? You see, we have the, the mindset of, you know what, okay, God, God is first because he says he's first, and then, you know, this is second, third. No, you, we missed the point. When the Bible says, I am the Lord your God, you shall know their gods before me, guess what? That's not a ranking system. That's not first, second, third. That means there is no one else like me, so there's no one else in the room that even compares. There is no first, second, third. There's just me. That is the meaning behind the text. It's just God. Are we seeking him first? What is our relationship like with him? Are, are, are we looking at that standard? See, the standard is what comes next because he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. So two things are happening here. I am seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
I am seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what I'm doing. Which is to say, you know what? There is a standard that exists. There is a standard of God's kingdom and there is a standard of God's righteousness. See, we, we live in a time just like any other time and in a culture where, where what is right, what we call righteousness, is fluid and it changes. And all of a sudden, we start gauging what is acceptable and right by what this famous person does or what that famous person does or who condones it or whether the multitude of society says it's okay. And God's standard doesn't change, nor his righteousness ever change. And he says, I want you to seek my standard, which is unchanging. But see, we've got to understand and apply God's standard, right? Right? It's kind of like this. I've told you before, there's, there's this little boy, and he comes up to his mom, and he's all excited. He says, Mommy, 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 Mommy. Guess what? She, he goes, I measured myself, and did you know I'm seven feet tall? Boy's five years old. Mom looks at him and goes, Oh, really? Really? Well, how did you measure yourself? Oh, real easy. I, I measured myself by feet. Oh, Really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I found something, the length of my foot, and then measured it all the way up. I'm seven feet. We understand that that's a little humorous because the standard is not being used. The correct standard is not being used. We've got to remember to orient in our lives to use the correct standard. And what's out there in the world is not going to give you the correct standard. Only God can do that. So am I seeking first God's standard. Am I seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? First. First. I believe if we're honest with ourselves, that's a challenging statement. That's a challenging statement. Because we find so many other things that we discussed in the gap that want to interfere and take its place. Want to interfere and take its place. Sometimes we look at it like this. There, there was a room in our house when I was growing up. You know, it was called the living room, right? And the living room, that was that room we couldn't play in. That was the room that it always got dusted. It always got cleaned. Everything was in its perfect place. There were no nicks, no marks, no anything in the living room. Pretty soon, the living room even developed these doors, and when we had guests come over, guess where we would take them? Into the living room. But when we lived our, our daily life, what we would do day to day, we would hang out in the family room. That's where we would hang out. See, the family room had all, all the nicks, the marks, the bumps, the bruises. You know, it was worn, it was used. It had things in it that we crashed into. I mean, this room was lived in this room was some of us look at our faith and our lord and we only, we keep him in the living room we, we keep him in the pretty nice held up place why for the same reason we don't take our guests into the family room because we don't want them to see all the mess and somehow or another we think we're just going to keep god over here in this pretty little room when God is saying, no, 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 if I am first in your life, then I want to be in every single room in the house. And, we may, and we're going to start with this family room. We're going to start with your life that has the bumps and the bruises and the nicks and the marks. Because guess what? I know it all anyways. It's kind of like when you're a kid and your mother cleans your room and you think you've done a great job. And what does she do? She ruins it by opening the closet. Because somehow or other, we think that, oh, yes, this is all pretty, and Mom's never going to find out because I got it all shoved and hidden away. Mom knows right where it is. Let me tell you something. God knows all your bumps and your bruises, your mistakes and your ups and your downs. You're not hiding it from him, so just let him in. Who am I seeking first? Am I seeking his standard first? Am I seeking his kingdom first? Am I seeking his righteousness first? And as that becomes challenging, guess what? We need to do it anyways. We live as a part of God's kingdom. And guess what? We carry his banner and we plant it wherever we go. 
Do we understand that concept? Regardless of what the standard of righteousness in the world says, this is what we do. How many have ever seen an anthill? Come on now. Do you think the ants come and ask your permission before they build this anthill? No, they do not. But guess what they're doing? They're acting as a collective unit, as a part of a body whose head is a queen, right? So what they do is when they expand their kingdom, what their queen wants them to do, they don't care what you think. They don't care your yard is pretty. They don't care your vegetables are there. They don't care that your kids play there. What they do is they build their hill. Do you do that with God's kingdom? Because our king says, go and plant my flag. Are we worried about what people think, or do we proclaim God's kingdom and seek it first? Do we do it in the midst of our job, in the midst of our school, in the midst of our family, in the midst of our friends, in the midst of a culture that says, we don't care about God? Do we say, just like the ant, I don't care what you think. My God says, plant this, I'm going to plant it. And guess what? When you step in this direction, you're going to feel it. You're going to hear my God. Are we seeking God's kingdom first? Because guess what happens? As, as we start to clear out the gap of all these things that may be important, that absolutely have value, but should not come first, then we can rebuild. But we got to clear out the gap. We got to clear out the gap. In 1871, there was called the Great Chicago Fire. It burned, I believe, over three square miles of the city center. Guess what they did after this fire decimated all of these buildings? That left room for the first skyscrapers in Chicago to be built. It may cause you some pain. It may cause you some discomfort to start saying, okay, I need to reprioritize what's in this gap. But once you do and you begin to clear that out, guess what? God can build in your life things you never thought possible. You, you want to grow in your walk with God? You want to grow in your faith with God? Seek him first. Start clearing out the gap. Watch him build in your life. But we've got to seek him first. We've got to seek him first. I want you to notice something in verse 32. It says, all of these things, the clothes, the drink, the food, he says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. This is what the rest of the world is looking for. Matter of fact, the Bible says, eagerly seek all these things. But notice as he goes on to say in verse 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Then he goes on in verse 34, therefore don't worry about tomorrow. Did you notice in this passage one thing or several that reoccur? He says over and over again, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Now you all are just worried about that, huh? Some of us, we get into the mode where if you actually added one more thing to worry about, you'd probably say, well, I got to get that for to two weeks from now. That's how many things you're worried about. When God says in his word, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But why is that? Because I seek him first. I look for him first. I have faith in my God that all of these needs he's going to take care of. And so I'm going to look for him first over anything else. Do we, do we truly understand that concept? It's, it's like this. It's like, a, it's like this man, he, he was late for a flight, right? I've been there. I've missed my flight. But anyways, so he's late for a flight. He's running through the airport, running through the airport. And finally, he sees this man in a pilot uniform, and, and the man stops. He says, whoa, 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 where are you going? He says, well, I'm trying to catch X next flight. And the man says, pilot says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, why not? He goes, because I'm the pilot of that flight. You're, you're good. As long as you're with me, you're taken care of. So this man, in haste and worry and concern, is running down the airport, but he comes face to face with the man who's driving the plane, with the man who's flying the plane. And all of a sudden, this worry, this anxiety, it goes out the door. Why? Because now he's walking step and step with the pilot. 
Sometimes we got to shed our worry and understand, you know what? I may be scurrying through life, but when I come face to face with the God who flies me, then I don't have to worry anymore because he's the one who, who's the pilot. He is the one in control. He is the one leading. Man, I don't got to worry about this anymore. The key is this. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Seek him first. What order and position does he have in my life? And when you start doing that, remember, it's not one, two, three. It's God on this page and nothing else. Because guess what? He's going to take care of this over here. But we have to understand that. We have to realize that. If you are here this morning and you desire to reorient your life towards Jesus Christ, if you recognize that, you know what, I have not been putting him first and I want to put him first, then we want to come alongside you and help you. Whether you need to be baptized into Christ, become a Christian, rise up out of those waters, a new creation, clean of all your sins, or if you are coming back to the body of Christ, we want to come alongside you. We want to walk with you as you repent and turn again. We will walk in this journey side by side. Guess what? Just like that ant hill, the ant doesn't do it alone. And neither do we. We have a king who leads, a Holy Spirit who fills, and a son who died for us. And we will make and walk this journey together. If we can help you in any way or pray for you for anything, then please come forward as together we stand and together we sing.